I want to talk about muscle relaxants. So the other thing that has been a real uh, favorite tool of mine is baclofen. Now, it's not a particularly potent muscle relaxant, um, but it seems to, for me and for the patients of mine in whom it works, offer something that something really potent like Valium doesn't bring all the baggage of, of, of a benzo. Yeah. Or even a flexoril where you can kind of get the drowsiness and frankly, a lot of people just, I mean, I used to even get nauseous on flexoril. Okay. But something about baclofen, I don't even know it's in me yeah. at 20 milligrams twice a day, but it actually takes the edge off. And where I typically find this beneficial is if I slept wrong and I get a kink in my trap yeah. or I've been on a super long drive and my QLs sort of flare a little bit. And I know that if I had all the time in the world, I could go and stretch my way out of that. But sometimes I just don't have that time and I need to kind of get right back to doing something awful like sitting and just you know, two or three days of 20 milligrams of baclofen BID with a little NSAID and like, I'm as good as new and I save myself the, you know, the real flare up. So what, what are yeah. your experience with muscle relaxants? Beautiful case example, by the way, for yourself of how we would use those. Um, baclofen is one of the safest to use. It is not habit forming like the somas. Yep and others that can be uh, like a barbiturate can act and people can get highly psychologically dependent on them. The flexorils have a, uh, anti have a tricyclic antidepressant property about them that may sometimes be helpful for people in various mixed mm. pain states, but also can cause sedation. Yep. The baclofen seems to be pretty benign. Um, we don't typically use muscle relaxants for long-term chronic conditions. The data hasn't borne out. Now, with that said- So how many days are you comfortable with a person? Oh, I'm, I'm comfortable with a person being on baclofen all their life, to oh, be you clear. Are? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just everything I'm doing, I, I know I'm, forgive me if I'm preaching to the choir here. Everything I'm doing is taken in the context of the person in front of me and the cost and benefit of the treatments I'm providing them. Meaning there are costs with baclofen. I don't mean monetary cost. Yeah. It can cost sedation. What dose is typically or is it just individual? Like I think it's, it's individual and obviously it is dose dependent. The higher dose yeah. is more sedation. Um, we can use baclofen intrathecally. We put in hmm. intrathecal pumps for baclofen. Uh, this is a beautiful, life-saving, minimal surgery that we do um, for people with a spinal cord injury, intractable spasticity, uh, because to get the spasms under control with oral doses, you just can't get there. So we, we put, thread a little catheter into the CSF and we deliver baclofen that way. Mm. Now, it, it again is a clean, relatively <clears throat> relatively safe medication but i'm always evaluating long term is this person getting benefit from this should we be talking about dialing it back and trying to wean and if they're not getting benefit then why should they stay on the medication and i i know you do the same types of things in your practice so um we use it we can use it in acute subacute we'll use it in some chronic conditions uh, as a trial mm -hmm. what's a trial month two months okay and then we monitor data on every single person. And what dose are you comfortable up to 20 milligrams three times a day? Yeah, up to 80 milligrams, I believe, is kind of the upper end. I don't usually get there. Okay. Um, you alluded to Neurontin earlier. Yeah. And you alluded to the fact that it played a role in my recovery because once we got the big stuff out of the way, I still had a couple of years of peripheral nerve injury. Yeah. And... The only way to put the fire out in my foot was Neurontin. And unfortunately, it was initially, it required four grams a day. I was taking a gram four times a day or something like that. Yeah. And the good news is it worked. The bad news is you're pretty much always tired. So I was very happy over time to get that dose down. And I think within 18 months, I was completely off the Neurontin and lo and behold, never experienced... A, 
Although interestingly, maybe once every year, I get like an enormous surge of fire into that same foot. Hmm. Literally one shot of flame that lasts seconds and it's gone, but if essentially never again. Right. Um, is Neurontin still a very powerful tool in the use of neuropathic pain? You alluded to other drugs like antidepressants as well, um, in addition to a rather impotent anti-seizure med. But yeah, what else, what else do you have at your disposal for this type of pain? The beauty of Neurontin or Gabapentin and its um, cousin, Pregabalin, uh, which was introduced immediately after Gabapentin's patent ran out. Mm -hmm. So Conveniently. Very conveniently. Um, both have the same mechanism of action. They work on the alpha-2 delta subunit of a calcium channel in the spinal cord in the brain. That's a little um, too jargony and technical, but think of them as agents that turn down uh, the signals that are heading up, that are in the spinal cord being processed and in the brain. So they're really not impacting your nerve out, out here or in your leg. Um, they can be very effective. The beauty of these two drugs is uh, there's no lethal dose. Like the only way they could kill the rats when they were studying it was to drown them in it. <laughs> yeah. I used to say, or hit them over the head with the tablets. And I would tell a patient somewhat Jokingly, the only way you can be hurt taking this drug is if you're struck by a truck that's carrying it. Um, it's a little bit more nuanced than that because there are side effects. Yep. You could fall asleep driving. You can fall asleep driving. I tell people don't operate heavy machinery, don't go, you know, doom buggy riding, don't blah, blah, blah. Um, there is, in an elderly patients in particular, uh, I warn them about falls because you can get a little unstable. Now, pregabalin can also lead to weight gain, right? Doesn't it also increase Both. appetite? Both, Both. of them do. Okay. Well, it's more I see water retention. Got it. I see a little peripheral edema in both. And they also both enhance sleep, especially pregabalin. And so there's, there's a little bit of an added benefit to patients who are using these to also put the pain out at night when it can be most noticeable. Um, there was actually a study, I, I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to find it. It was sent to me that actually suggested pregabalin didn't just make you drowsy, which was obvious, but, but also promoted appropriate sleep architecture. I don't know the data on the sleep architecture, and that would be something I'd be putting out to you or some of the sleep experts. Um, I, have, uh, I have taken it uh, after surgery. And uh, I find that it makes me sedated. I don't find the quality of the okay. sleep. Okay, I, I mean, but I could be, I could be, I could be totally well, wrong on that. But no, no, well, we both could be recognize your experience. Yeah. that's it. Yeah. That's it. It could just simply be my experience. The truth is, uh, I do tend to when I dose it. I'll dose lower in the day, and then I'll wallop a little harder at night mm. for the very reason. So let's imagine gabapentin. You know, maybe in the day, 300, 300, 600 at night. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to titrate that so that one, it helps them sleep because you brought up an incredibly important point, which is during the day, we've got all these modulatory things we can do around our pain, distraction, for instance, other coping strategies at night, you're just trying to get into this relaxed state. And that is the worst time for somebody with chronic pain. And so the gabapentin, and sometimes other agents can help with that. So yeah, I do use it to help people sleep. Um, no lethal dose. Uh, Max is out at around 900 to 1,000 milligrams at a dose because it's, it's taken up by an active transport system in the small intestine. Once you take more than about 1,000 milligrams, the rest of it's just passed out your backside. Pregabalin is different. It, it has a, what's called a linear kinetic profile, simply meaning the more you take, the more that gets in your system. So the only times I will typically switch somebody from a gabapentin if they're getting benefit is when they've maxed out the dose. They're getting benefit, but there's no point in giving them more. I'll switch to pregabalin where I can drive more into their system. And again, you're using these for the most recalcitrant neuropathic pain typically? I'm using these for the most recalcitrant pain in general. So that's an important point. Um, while 
I can speak to perioperative pain, acute pain, subacute pain, and chronic pain. Stanford, we tend to see, we're a tertiary referral center. I tend to see, we see people after they've seen everybody else. And so by definition, what's the, we didn't even do this, I'm sorry, we didn't define chronic pain, but how would you put a definition on that? There's various definitions. Some like to put a time frame on it, which I think many of us believe is a little artificial. It's not three months or six months. It is pain that persists beyond the expected time of tissue healing. So it is nuanced. It's context specific, meaning if you have an inguinal hernia repair or a prostatectomy, which you know, should heal up pretty quickly and your pain should go away pretty quickly. But if you've got pain after a couple, few months, that's starting to get to that point where I'm a little worried something's going on from a chronic pain. But if you had a total knee replacement, that is a massive, massive surgery and you're going to have pain for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't call that, I wouldn't call chronicity for yep. a total knee. No, it makes sense. Would, I'm, okay. It totally makes sense. Context specific. Um, this gets into also some of the whole issue around opioid prescribing and these rigid timeframes for surgery and, and what have you, but persistence beyond the time of expected tissue healing. Mm -hmm.